Hello and welcome to today's online event, how to navigate the online world when it comes to meetings and events. My name is Sarah, I'm from Red Back to Connect and I am joined by my very trusty colleague over here, Michael Bunker. Hi Sarah. How are you? Very good, thank We've you. We've got distance today we as well, um, even though we are in the studios, uh, but we would love to welcome everyone to this event. We know it's very uncertain out there, um, however, it has actually changed over how many weeks now? I think the 25th of Feb was the last time we were in the studio talking about potentially what might happen with COVID-19. Um, and as we can see, things have just shifted rapidly when it comes to online. Yeah, there's nothing like a global pandemic to force change in an environment. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So today we're going to cover four key areas. Um, so grab yourself a beverage of choice. It's Friday afternoon and we thought we'd do this to keep it lighthearted and give you some tips and advice. Um, so Michael, what are we going to discuss today? So today we're looking at four main areas. We're looking at remote working. So we're all working from home now, so some tips and tricks. Uh, virtual conferences. So we now know that we've had to go past the point of actually running physical events. And what are we doing for those virtual conferences? Online experience. So what's happening for the actual yep. presenters? And then looking at virtual AGMs. Excellent. Um, before we get into this, I just want to let people know that we will be referring to some resources. So that includes some blogs and some ebooks and some other useful information, which is located in the resources tab, which is the light blue drop down. And at any time, please feel free to ask us a question by clicking the blue raise hand icon and that will come through on the iPad. So let's talk about remote working, first of all. Yeah, you've been working from home for quite a while. Yes. So what, let's talk about your experiences and what's happened now. Yeah, so I started working um, remotely two days a week uh, from July 2019 and part of that was because obviously to save the two hours traveling to work each way yep. as I did move house. So for me it took me a long time to actually get into it and I think now with the shift I was quite fortunate that I was sitting my groove and yep. I knew what was happening um, but it has been quite difficult and it did take me some time. So I'm going to give you some tips not only on how you can help yourself manage your work remotely but also how you can help manage remote teams as well. But before we do, I want to play a little video because I sometimes feel with the amount of video conferences I'm on every single day from home, it can seem a little bit like this. And this is a video I think we've all seen, but it's only a few seconds and it's short to lighten up the mood. So Jordan, can you please play the video? Scandals happen all the time. The question is how do democracies respond to those scandals? Uh, and what will it mean for, uh, for the wider region? I think one of your children has just walked in. I mean, shift is shifting Shifting sands in the region, do you think relations with the North may change? Um, I would be surprised if they do. The, um, pardon me. Pardon me. My apologies. What is this going to be for the region? My apologies. North, uh, sorry. Um, North Korea, North, uh, South Korea's policy choices on North Korea have been severely limited in the last six months to a year. So I think we've all seen that before. Uh, that's the Professor Kelly video. And that was before everything became so crazy like it is now. So that sort of does feel like the new norm. But when we got, when I went into working from home, here were some thoughts that crossed my mind. So the first one was, I'm going to get this office space sorted. Yep. I'm going to have a desk. And I did. I got a nice chair, had a double screen, even had the motivational posters, which were really, really inspiring for some time. Um, the thought of sleeping in extra for two days, obviously, um, for two hours, sorry, was very appealing mm -hmm. to me as well. I could get dinners ready much earlier. I could get up and have a great breakfast. It would feel like the weekend every day. And I really didn't think much was going to change. However, expectations versus reality. So from that, I soon realised that it wasn't what I thought and yep. what I had in my head. And in order for me to be more productive, here are some things that I actually took on board. So first of all, when I got up, it's just sitting there in my pyjamas or sitting there in my active wear, which I have done once or twice and Michael see me, isn't really going to put me in work mode. And I remember uh, many years ago when I started my first corporate job, my managing director didn't believe in casual Fridays because he simply thought it changed your mindset. So if you dress for the job, then you're going to act and behave in a certain way. This isn't too true, it's not too true in the fact that I didn't get my high heels on or put my hair straightener through my hair on the day, but I had to dress like I could be in business mode to some extent. So that was great for me. As soon as I knew that I was dressed and I was ready for the day, that switched me into productivity mode. And then the office thing as well was really um, difficult for me. And I had this office, but it's sort of in a hallway. And while it was set up with everything that I needed, I just didn't feel like it was right for me. And I think 
with people, we're so used to being in an office environment and things that are open plan yeah. these days. So putting yourself in an environment where you're sort of confined to a small space doesn't usually work. You need to find a space where it's open and light and you can actually see what's happening around you. Wouldn't you agree? I do. I absolutely agree. I think the luxury for some households, you don't really get that, yeah. unfortunately, when yeah. you have multiple people all trying to work from home. Yeah. Um, but I agree. I've, I've seen Sarah's office work uh, space in her house. It lasted like that for maybe a month yeah. before it turned into a storage area. Yeah. <laughs> but the other thing as well, when you talk about environment, I know you do this. So if you do work with people or your yeah. staff actually work with people that live around them, get up and go for a walk with them and have a walk and talk meeting. That's something that you've done, haven't you? Yeah, I love it. It's yeah. one of the ways to get the steps up, but also to get some fresh air yeah. and see someone else during these times. And you're exercising <laughs> as well. Um, set time for lunch and also meetings mm -hmm. as well. So I think we've all experienced this and this was one of the reasons I decided to have this webinar at this time. You're working and you're on all the time when you're working from home. So you suddenly look up and it's 2.30 and you haven't had lunch. So between that 11 to 1 period yeah. is when I'm in go, go, go mode and so many people who I've spoken to have said the same thing. So I've started to schedule meetings after that time. Yeah. I've actually started to run my webinars at that time. And for people out there who are running online events, consider that time for your webinars. So here at Redback, we have a massive block where people are running all their events between 10 to say 2. 2, yeah in that time period. So think about the amount of content that is actually getting put out there online and how you're potentially competing with that. And I know I get to the 2.30, 3 o'clock mark, head up, okay, put the kettle on, have a cup of tea, yeah. take some time to reflect. Um, if it's a Friday, you know, probably 4 o'clock's a reasonable time to open up a uh, bottle of wine. <laughs> but start to actually think about how you can actually set time for yourself and make sure that you are eating right as well. Um, Definitely control your calendar as well. So yeah. Blocking out certain times because it's so easy for you to get inundated with multiple things getting yeah. put in your calendar. That's when you can miss meals, you can miss time to get up and walk around. Yeah. So I actually start blocking out specific times in your day where you can control your environment. Yeah. In terms of in terms of managing teams as well, so there's so many collaboration tools out there, which I'm sure everyone is aware of. So webinars is one thing and having the ability to stream content online for education purposes purposes or marketing purposes, but actually using collaboration tools. When you think of video conferencing, Teams, Skype, uh, WhatsApp, I know there's been times where I've actually been on six separate platforms, platforms in, one in one day. So you need to find out what works for you and your team and you need to make sure that there's consistency across that. And this has taken um, us a while to work out with our teams because it'll be like, okay, we're having a meeting, what platform, what's the agenda? You don't have an agenda because you're not used to working remotely and you're not used to getting online on time because you can't tap the person on the shoulder and say, get online. So what sort of, how have you used managed to get, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I think that because there is so many and you're kind of getting bombarded through the day, yeah. so you kind of want to start funneling some of the communications channels around. So especially with our business, we've got a bunch of different communications tools, but then we also use things like um, WhatsApp and yeah. we use it for massive company updates that everyone needs to know. So changes to SLAs, urgent things that need to be attended to, last minute events for yeah. our customers. We have a centralized communication tool there. So it's straight, yeah. it's instant, everyone gets notified. But then for the team stuff, I absolutely love having the video conferencing for meetings, yep. but also what we just did yesterday, we ended up putting a video conference up just to start running ideas past each other while we worked on two separate yep. projects. So then you weren't just sitting in your house by yourself. You had someone on the screen. Yep. You were able to run ideas by them. But each of these technologies is going to work differently for different people. Yep. So it is a bunch of trial and error just yep. to see what's going to work for you And guys. we personally um, thrive and bounce ideas of each other yes. at all times, and we were finding it both very difficult. We are working remotely, um, and we call each other throughout the day, but just having you up on the screen screen in the background while I was working, I felt like you were in the room with me. Yeah. And all of a sudden, we became so much more creative. What do you think about this? Should we do this? How about we change this? And it gave me some sense of normality yes. having that, um, which I really, <laughs> really liked. And we had a bit of fun with it as well. Um, so really think about communication channels. A few tips on this. Um, everything's going to get buried in your emails oh, yes. as well. So I find external stuff in emails is fine. But we are starting to switch people to use WhatsApp um, or Teams when it does actually come to um, internal stuff. Mm -hmm. Email signatures. So I've noticed even people I've been dealing with lately, I go to call them on their mobile, but they don't have their mobile number on their email signature. So I have to scroll through to find it. So if you're working remotely, take your um, landline off your actual um, email signature and put a number on there where people can actually get in contact with you. And that goes for your teams as well. I had to instruct my teams 
to do it because I actually <laughs> didn't think about it. And then sometimes I think a teleconference just works fine for a lot of these things. Yes. Um, I made a joke to Michael the other day, you know, in the morning, here's my video conferencing phase, and then it gets to 5 p.m. and I just look I, like I've <laughs> aged 20 years because I'm just drained yeah. from just talking to people and seeing people and being online is so different. Sometimes it's good just to have a teleconference, go sit in the backyard, go for a walk, and actually just change it up a bit. Yeah, you don't need to be on video all the time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We're getting really, really confined with video. Yes. Um, so let's go on to online conferences. Yes. So in the last probably six to seven weeks, mm -hmm. we've turned a lot of physical conferences into online, online events, events yeah. whether it be an hour or a day or two days. And personally, I've loved working with our customers. Yeah. The creativity, the willing to adapt to change, the agility that they've shown and the ability to pivot. I know that's a bit of a buzzword at the moment. <laughs> I think pivot's going to be the new webinar. Um, but the ability to do this, I think, has just been amazing. And I think in times like this, yeah. you really see companies shine and thrive and survive, thrive and survive, sorry. So can you talk us through online conferences and yeah. how this actually works? Absolutely. So we look at the two basic standards that we have up on the screen right now. And the first one was at the beginning of all this, when Sarah and I presented before when we were going into COVID-19, was around the physical events were still going ahead. And what were your backup options for the travel restrictions that are in place? Now, in the next month or two, we could be going back to the stage where physical events, small events mm. might be able to start up again. So you're going to have to have that virtual element still attached to it. So then we're looking at things like being able to beam presenters in or out. Yep. And that's really the easiest thing. It's being able to get anyone in the world using their webcam, beam them into a conference, beam them into a physical event or a smaller boutique one. And then the other side, you flip it around and then you're just streaming that event out to everyone else, especially if you're having to maybe restrict all the numbers. So you're still doing a small actual event, but able to beam that out. That's the main, the first one. Yep. The second one really is the one that we've been having to go through over the last six and seven weeks where all events have been canceled. Yep. Everything has been on lockdown. We had a look at really changing up absolutely everything that where you were thinking about a physical event and turning it on its head because it's now going into a virtual one. And I know we're gonna be talking about customer presenter experience mm -hmm. later on as well as participant experience. Um, so yeah, it's been absolutely amazing to see how people just didn't want to rest and be like, you know what, we're going to try to do the exact same thing. Everyone's taking a step back and it's like, okay, what's actually going to work for my audience? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So we've got a lot to go into on this in a little bit. Uh, but Sarah, let's go into looking before we even get to the event. How do we start designing the content? What are the things we really need to start looking at? Yeah, and I think um, never has it been more worthwhile to have this discussion because content for the online world does need to be adapted. Yeah. And to your point, Michael, what you were going to do in your physical event might need to be changed up a little bit. Um, and with some people have, yep, straight away shifted, made the shift. We've had people who have been changing up content and policies the night before based on new rules and legislations. Yeah. Um, so it really depends on your organisation and how willing you are to adapt and change. But really think about what you want to stream. So you don't want to necessarily stream all your content at the event. Some of your content can actually be live or pre-recorded uh, or some of it could actually be turned into um, video production yeah, um, absolutely. Videos that you may play and they don't have to be through a webinar as well. So think about how interactive you want your content as well. So if you are using a webinar platform with some of the things that you're going to go through in the actual presentation, could you get the audience involved in them and ask them a poll? So for example, some of my content right now is around how to create content for the online world. Yes. I could have created a poll, and now I'm thinking of this, I probably should have. Should have. <laughs> I could create a poll saying, um, what types of content do you create within your organisation at the moment. And then you guys could respond to the poll and I can then help create a conversation around that as well. Um, it's more than a standalone event as well. So, and Michael will go into this um, because we feel like there's been a shift in making physical conferences into digital experiences where yeah. your one day conference doesn't necessarily have to happen on one day. You could extend it out for a whole week yeah. if you wanted to as well. And there's actually a lot of research into that. But the next thing is marketing as well. So. Most of you, if you have had a physical event cancel, you will probably have a list of people who want to attend. Now's the time to potentially go out to people who couldn't actually make that physical event because of travel restrictions and actually promote the event to them. So we had an event that ran about four weeks ago and originally it was a Saturday event. Was it a two-day event? Yeah, it was originally, yeah. originally yeah. meant to be a two-day conference, two conference. turned into a one-day. Um, and they actually had 70 people who were going to register and attend physically over the two days. We switched that to online and we created um, 
two hours worth of live stream content from our Sydney studios in Canberra studios and we switched because yep. the presenters were there and then we went to pre-recorded content that people could access over a period of a week. They actually had 800 people register for that event. So from 70 to 800, 350 online live on the Saturday and then yep. a whole heap of people going back to watch that on-demand content. So think about your reach when it actually comes to that and think about your go-to-market strategy because it will actually change and probably flourish. Yeah, it's kind of funny. As you were talking about it, it's you kind of want to look at it into the three Cs. It's content um, community. So the community of people that you're looking at, the content that you're producing and going out to, and then the call to actions. Because physical I'm going events... to use that. Yeah, the three Cs. So we're going to trademark <laughs> this now. I just wrote it down. Yeah, community, content, and call to actions. Yeah. So you're looking at your community. That's your audience. Mm. Who is coming to the event? Yep. Now, because of all this, your community has got to be a lot bigger. The yep. people that are going to attend the event is a hell of a lot bigger. The actual content then is, okay, what are the best things you're going to be doing for those content pieces? That are going to be the live, mm. the keynotes, everything. What are the other bits that you can create that are on demand yep. or recordable stuff? And then the call to action. You think about your physical events that you go to. There's always a call to action there. Either it's sponsor exposure, mm. exhibitors. You're trying to get them to maybe sign up for something. You want to think about how you design your content with these call to actions in mind because that's yep. how the measurements of success ties back around. It's what are you trying to given the experience to people online, but also what's your end goal? What are those call to actions that you need to meet? So we've talked about marketing. I've totally digressed because I got caught up on these three Cs. So but, excited. But we'll look at location as well. So yeah. because of internet connection, your presenters can be anywhere in the world now. Like we're not restricted to being like, okay, only people that are willing to travel to Sydney to do this event, no. Your presenters can be globally, your audience can be globally. Yeah. There is no restrictions to this now. So you really need to be focusing on that, that this is global content. It's not local, it's not regional. You can be going global with anything that you do. Mm. Um, what you then want to be looking at, we have it up there, like, have they done it before? So looking at your presenters is the main thing. Have they done this before? If you're doing it from a venue where you're streaming on, have they done it before? Simple things like internet checks, asking them if they've mm. done that before. And then AV availability. That's more around the physical event, but also AV availability for your presenters, which we're going to go into. It's really, do they have webcams? Do they have a VoIP headset? If they don't have good internet quality or bandwidth at their house. And look, NBN, great, not designed for the whole of Australia to be mm. working from home. We've got presenters who are trying to do simple video sharing uh, in Vaucluse. But because there's so many people and so population mm. dense, they've got horrible coverage. So we're yeah. having to do everything over telephone. I think um, our, we um, had a uh, discussion around this the other day and our chief technical officer, he actually said, we're quite fortunate that everyone is actually working from home right now yeah. because if everyone were, if everyone was to be in their in their offices and they were all video streaming at the same time, it wouldn't work because our networks here in Australia, our pipes just don't have the yeah. capability for it. So I think you need to really think about your presenters as well. And we've had experiences before where, or even in the past few yeah. weeks, where presenters we've tested them and their their video quality is just not working. Yeah. And so you really need to think about: Do you want to sacrifice the audio and the content? over the video side of things. And that's because people's working habits have changed. So you've got a kid doing online learning in the background, yeah. then you've got people who are maybe streaming in the background, your partner may also be at work, and all of that internet that's being used is going to impact the quality. So I think just going on to presenters, I think the biggest thing is making sure they're presenting from somewhere where it's just, there's no one else using internet around them yes. as much as possible, but also use telephone lines to dial in and have a backup plan. Uh, Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think every year when we do the Redback Report, mm. live video I don't think has ever cracked the top three. No, no. It's about the content all the time. And you can yeah. maybe have the presenters on at the beginning, then you can maybe switch the, to a headshot of the presenter. You can show videos within there. Or if you really want video, consider pre-record. But if you do have presenters um, who have been briefed and they're not in an area where they do have good quality internet, then you really need to think about that side of things. And yeah, just don't chance it. Yeah. Um, so you're always speaking to customers. Yes. Yes, and you're very good at it. Um, so when it does come to online conferences, what are some common questions that you're hearing from them? Oh, look, everyone's kind of saying the same thing. And and you can see in the speech bubbles on the slide right now, my conference was, meant, was due to run for two days. How is this possible? Uh, how can I set my speakers up for success, which we just talked about, and I'll go into more. A uh, big one is how do breakout rooms work? Mm. Um, okay, this sounds great, but can I still make money? Which is probably the biggest one. Yeah, that we're let's go use. into these then. Yeah. So starting from top to bottom, look, you got to think about your attendees. And that's the big thing right now is that with the video that Sarah showed before, you're competing against everything in their lives while you're delivering content while they're at home. So would you sit behind your computer all day? 
for a one-day event? Is that a realistic thing to be expecting? And also for your presenters, if they know that they're presenting last, they're going to be looking at this going, these guys have been sitting there for eight hours. Am I mm -hmm. going to have anyone in my session? Yeah. Um, consider your speakers. So why not offer a mixture of live and pre-recorded? Now, the pre-recorded stuff is great, especially for international speakers. Mm. International speakers love to get their branding out. They love to present Australian content, but they hate the time difference. So offer them the ability to do this. Mm. The other thing, it doesn't mean you've got to sacrifice any engagement with the participants. Because if you're honest saying, hey, guys, these three sessions will be pre-recorded, you can submit questions now that we will provide to the speakers that they can then put into their recordings. It doesn't have to be one or the other. You can actually make both work. Breakout rooms. Not all sessions should be streamed, absolutely, and your online communities. Now, breakout sessions require a little bit more administration work. Some platforms have them built in, which is great. Others don't. You want to tie these together with one main event. So running a studio job, running a remote webinar, allowing people then to go off in a break for maybe 20 minutes or half an hour to do the work, but with a call to action to come back to your mainstream. Uh, they're quite fun. They're very interactive, but there's a lot of testing that you're going to need to do. And that's the big thing, is testing is key with anything that you're doing remotely or digital. Yeah, yeah. Uh, test and brief, so exactly what I was just talking about. Con uh, connectivity, functionality, and backup options. Most platforms and or all platforms should allow you to have two concurrent things going in there. So you can have the video and VoIP headset going into the platform, mm. and then potentially a backup telephone line as well. So you know if the speaker drops out automatically, they can pick up their phone, unmute it, and continue their presentation. You want to offer these mm. things. And the backup is not just for your presenters like us right now. You want to offer it for people that don't have great connectivity. So offer them a backup telephone conference number that they can dial into and yep. they can just listen to, which is great. Uh, and format is key. So be prepared to change <laughs> and ensure you have breaks. So breaks offer amazing opportunities in online events, especially conferences and virtual conferences, because where you had exhibitors and sponsors before that would have a real big presence at mm -hmm. the actual event, you could offer these break times for them. These break times can have pre-rolled videos. They can have Q&A sessions with them as well. You can utilize dead air. You aren't going to expect that a lot of people will get up and leave to go do stuff during these breaks, but why not put something in that time that you can then take the MP4 afterwards and then promote that as well. So yeah, lots and I of think tips. I think what I like here is think like an attendee. Um, and I I knew that okay, it's not feasible to literally have someone sitting behind a screen all day while they're working from home, but I actually experienced it the other day. So we had our um, corporate off-site, strategic off-site, yep. which we would usually do over two days um, down in Piermont, really, really nice, sitting around the table. Obviously, you know, great discussions and really interactive, and we did it online. And our facilitator was fantastic. He had a 360-degree camera set up yep. as well. He had this um, digital blackboard in the background as well that he would write yep. on and we would see. But I was so exhausted afterwards. And <laughs> we took breaks every five minutes, but as it got to that 3 o'clock mark, I just didn't physically feel like I was focused and ready to go. And I think in hindsight, maybe two half days would have been better, yeah. something like that. And we did get a lot out of it, but I think that was really important for me to actually see that from an attendee's point of view as well. So I think, you know, whenever you're sitting out mapping out what your online conference is going to look like, as soon as you make a decision, just say that. What would an attendee do? Or yeah. how would this, how is this going to be for the attendee experience? Because we do think about our presenters and we do think about our attendees, but thinking about them at the same time doesn't necessarily happen. No, not at all. Great. So let's talk about the making money part because, yes. of course, people still want to make money. Yeah. And we have spoken about the fact that you can go out to an entirely new audience or perhaps an audience that wasn't originally keen on actually attending your event. However, sponsorship is also very, very, um, it's huge when it comes to online events. And I personally don't think it's used as best as it could be. Oh. So if you go to the resource tab, um, you'll actually find there's 21 ways to build value for sponsors. It's mm -hmm. a blog piece and it actually lists just really short and sharp ways that you can actually do this. It's not a 20 page article or anything. We wouldn't do that to you. Um, but essentially when it comes to sponsors, think about it in three buckets, pre, during and post event. So your pre-event, you think about your, web, your uh, website, your mm -hmm. landing pages, your registration pages, logos, logos, logos. Yeah. And we were speaking to a customer the other day and she had different events. So she had a series of 10 different events she wanted to run over two days and they all had separate sponsors. And the whole idea was, okay, let's just bring one person into one event and have the sponsor logos everywhere. 
No. No. <laughs> the idea, what you want to do, you want to make this lucrative for your sponsors. So, therefore, event number one has a page where people actually, you've got a master page where it's got all your events. Event number one is sponsored by X company. It's got their logos on it. Maybe before that event starts, they play a video that yep. actually talks about that. And then that um, sponsor can then capture that data as well. And they can actually see who's interested in their product or whatever. whatever they can even turn the session. Yeah. yeah. So really think about um, your pre-event advertising and how you want your sponsors to be involved. Um, newsletters and emails, any form of marketing that you would do for your physical event, you can use the same for your virtual event. So during, you've mm -hmm. already alluded to with using videos, um, transitioning slides into that as well, virtual expo halls, so using something like the resource library that we've used today to link off mm -hmm. into ex uh, virtual expo halls, or perhaps even for, um, force redirecting everyone to an expo hall as well. But using polls and surveys and Q&A for competitions and stuff like that, that can also work a treat. Good old gamification. Yeah, exactly. And then um, after as well, so utilising your on-demand content and using different forms of data collection as well. So one of the biggest benefits for your sponsors with a virtual event is the fact that they don't just get access to your attendees for one day. They have access until your event is hosted on demand and it could be up to 12 months, however long you like. Yeah. So their sponsorship dollar lives on for a lot longer. So really have these conversations with your sponsors um, and like I said, take a look at that blog piece because you'll find some useful information. Anything else you recommend me sponsors? Oh, look, I think there's some interesting things that I've been doing right now with a couple of customers around the, the, the features and the functionality where they are opting in to do a two full day conference. It's just the traditional way. Um, you do want to look at an experience point of view, but this they've opted in to do this. Mm. But the different sessions are done by different sponsors. So what we're doing quite cool, instead of having the speaker image that we can turn on and off, we've got that as the session sponsor logo. Mm. So very seamlessly, as one speaker goes to the next, that logo just changes. Yep. And then for the on-demand, we're actually breaking them down into individual one-hour yeah. ones, so then the sponsors are just getting theirs. Yep. So there's cool ways of using the features on the functionality of the platform to do simple um, things. What I want to do, I'm just going to keep this slide up so everyone can just have a look at this um, brief action plan yep. um, that I think is quite handy. We won't go through with it, but just as we go to this question, maybe take a look. And we'll also send this recording out on Monday as well, as well as um, the PowerPoint slides and supporting documents. But we have a question from Ali. So when it comes to hosting your events on demand, how can you make them interactive? Can you still have people submit questions? Yes. Absolutely. Elaborate. <laughs> Elaborate. <laughs> You don't really lose too much functionality. The problem, not the problem, but you want to design your on-demand content so it's easy for you to manage as well as for participants to engage with. So the simple things of like anything that you do online with a webinar provider or anything should be hosted for a specific period of time. So that can be up to minimum, generally is about 12 months that you can have that up there for. But then also think of using the on-demand content to make money for the rest of your content. So maybe giving teaser bits, 10 minutes of an on-demand file that gets marketed out of everyone saying, hey, have a look at the speaker who spoke at our event. Click here to watch the, t uh, the movie, the video. They get 10 minutes of it and then the call to action underneath is, hey, you want to see the rest of the content? Click here. You're selling that on-demand content. But what about, so if you're watching on-demand and is there like an ask a question that yeah. you could have in on-demand and then so where does that like, question go? So that goes back into your reporting. So you will have to keep going to check it, but the other things you can do is potentially build custom buttons, buttons that is like you wish to submit a question in the on-demand. Instead of it going to the back end of the reporting where you'd have to go and do that, link it to building an email. Mm -hmm. So as soon as you click to ask it, it actually populates an email, pops open on the screen, the subject's already in there, and it's saying, question from this session. Yep. And then all they have to do is just type into the body of that email uh, and send it off to you guys. It's a much easier way of doing that instead of having to remember to keep going back in and yeah. checking your reporting. Yep, great. No worries. Okay, online so, conferences. Online conferences. So, Sarah, okay. <laughs> conferences are one thing, but uh, about online experience, what do you mean by this? So, I think with um, online experiences, um, I like the word experiences better, purely um, just because it sounds nicer than online webinar. Um, but here are some common questions when it does come to just your regular webinars that you're running on a regular basis. And I'll just say that people are craving content now. So, for the majority of our partners and customers, they're seeing huge amounts of um, attendees. And if you go, there's a case study um, in the drop-down um, box that's um, from Australian Property Institute, and they actually talk about content and how people are craving that and the increase they've seen. So anyone running any sort of events relating to COVID-19, which pretty much all events are right now, yes. and topics that can actually help people, whether it's about dealing with mental health or helping members or working closely with your customers in a time like this, People are seeing their attendance rates double and potentially triple as well. Yeah. But 
Let's really think about, um, you know, we've got these common questions that we spoke about before. Let's go into the platform itself and how you can utilise the platform to help you run better online experiences. So obviously before you want to market your event as you usually would, you get those people to turn up and then you want to create this experience online. So I think we go back to thinking like an attendee and what I mean by that is as an attendee, you're doing a few things right now. You're listening, you're watching, you've got tabs there where you can actually click on links, you may have emails coming through, you've got a question tab. So there's a lot of different things that you may be taking in and a lot of different actions that you can complete. You want to make it interactive, but you don't want to overwhelm people. So really make sure that you've got either a chat box or an ask a question tab. Some people have both, which I'm a little bit iffy with, um, really depends on the types of event you're running. Make sure you utilise the resource library and make sure, I think facilitation is key when it comes to running an event, don't you? And I having do. someone... Someone there that you can work, bounce off of and work with makes a huge difference. Mm. But yeah, to Sarah's point and everything, when you're starting off, especially in the beginning and running new programs and everything, you don't want too many things to distract people. Yeah. Keep it simple. The whole thing about having an ask a question and a chat those things, having the two together only work once you have an established community that's mm. been doing it a lot. Yep. And they know to use them as different mediums because a chat's an unmoderated thing. Chat yep. is just, I want to talk about your event. Yep. I'm going to talk to the other people in this one. The ask a question is for your presenter so you can yep. actually control your conversation. Yeah, exactly. And then think about providing access to resources as well, which you can see we've actually done in the um, resource folder. Yep. So the drop down there um, and captioning and translation. That I if you them. really want to take your event to the next level. Yeah, and right now and I even think I did it the other day where I listened to a webinar, but I put live captions on it yep. just because it was easier for me to do that, have the live captions on the screen while I was working on something else. Yep. I, I was listening to another podcast actually at the same time, multitasking in the worst goddamn way. Yeah. But it was a nice way to do it. And the transcription to have afterwards allows you to create written content from your video content. Yeah. So utilize the two. Yeah. Yeah. If you have something transcribed and our content writer actually was looking at an event we, we ran last time and blogging about that. And the first thing she said was, did you have it transcribed? Because then she could easily write content about it as opposed to having to listen to me for an entire half hour. Yeah. Um, but, you know, think about stuff like that if this is part of your overall marketing strategy as well and you are going to be maybe using it for podcasts or any sort of blogs. Um, I will just respond to a question from Alan as well around the map icon, which is on our platform, and does the map icon show the physical location of people attending the webinar? Yes, it does. It does. Yeah. Well, the closest... Yeah. IP ping yeah. to them, yep. depending on how their internet service provider is set up. Yeah, yes. exactly. So it gives you an indication on where people are joining from, whether they are in Australia, yeah. New Zealand, or anywhere else in the, around the world. So that's just a little bit of fun, I think, that map icon. Um, and it's good for people to see how far and wide their content is actually reaching. So <laughs> the platform, we understand how you can... That's a very, very quick overview. Yes. Um, and I think with this advice, it's important to say that every event is different. So that means what you versus the next company versus the company after you are trying to achieve will be different. Your audiences, your outcomes and your end goals are all going to be very different as well. So this is just really generic advice. We can't make it too specific, um, but you can contact me at any time or Michael if Absolutely. you want some more information. So once the event is over, it's not over. And that's what we really mean, yeah, <laughs> by experience, because yeah. we've we've got average attendance rates around. Well, they've actually jumped by around five percent. We've mm -hmm. seen in the last few months. So your average attendance rate is probably around the forty percent mark, maybe forty-two percent mark now. That means you've still got sixty percent of people who are going to want to watch the recording or interact with your content on demand. So yeah. how can you further engage these people and extend the experience? Absolutely. After? There's a number of ways, but I'm going to try to simplify this and shorten it. So one of the ones is looking at the content you just created and how can that be repurposed? Mm. So that's probably the main one. I think it's one that people underutilize a little bit. You have the things of the content being hosted for 12 months. Yep. Using interactive tools like polling data and everything, like a question that was asked, yep. is a great way of actually marketing your on-demand content, saying, hey, 85% of people said this to our poll and our live webinar, click here to watch the on-demand. So you're constantly promoting that on-demand so people don't forget about it. Yeah. Then look at the other file formats that you can get from an on-demand yeah. piece of content. So you have it hosted, you can get an MP4 file, so you can use that MP4 file to break it up like I talked about before, maybe create a teaser video that's then going to push people back to the actual hosting. And the reason why I keep talking about pushing people back to the hosting is where you get the analytics and data. Mm. That's why I love. But the other one, I think, is people are getting really used to podcasts, and it's really easy on transport. It's really great to be able to do it. So instead of asking people on their mobile to click on a 
link and actually stream video, it's better to take from that MP4 file, rip the audio component out of it, and turn it into a podcast. Yeah. You're now taking one piece of content, you're making multiple things out of it, which I absolutely love. Yep. And I think it's a really great way to do it. But also look at the things we have up on the screen right now. We had great speakers. There's nothing stopping you from doing more touchpoint events or using community builder tools like LinkedIn groups and everything where your presenters can go in and post questions to the attendees a week after or two weeks mm -hmm. after saying, hey guys, I've reviewed the questions that I wasn't able to uh, answer during the session, and they can start posting responses in there. You're trying to tie things together around the community of people that you're engaging with and turning a single event into kind of a multi-touch point one now. Yeah. And your marketing strategies, but also utilizing your speakers, using your social media channels. There's so much that can be done from this. Yeah. And again, we want to generate leads from this. It's what are the call to actions that you're using in each one of these methods to bring it all together. Yeah. yeah, and I think the word community, once again, we go back to as well. This is not about a one-off webinar um, no. event. This is actually about an online experience that will potentially have multi-touch points, like you said. And just on that as well, I think this goes into the um, during the event and after the event. Any sort of questions or interactions, and you mentioned polls, anything that comes from questions. So, for example, Ali asked before around on-demand um, questions. Yeah. That question, potentially even Alan's question around the map, I could then turn that into a piece of content. So mm -hmm. after all, if I, if I was smart and if I had the time right now, <laughs> I could actually say, uh, I could create a blog. It's like how to um, engage people and collect questions once your webinar's over. Yeah. Or I could create a short video on that. So use the data that comes through um, and after all your events, you will have a tra question transcript. And with some of the events we're running now where you've got hundreds of people online, you will not be able to get through all these questions. So yeah. it's important that you download that transcript and then use it to the best of your knowledge. I think the most that I've had in the last month was one customer got a thousand questions wow. in their four hour event. Glad I wasn't facilitating that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're now going to go on to our last topic um, mm -hmm. and it's just a quick one because this has come up obviously um, with some new guidelines mm -hmm. that have been changed by ASIC um, on March 20. So the corporate regulator ASIC, as we all know, um, with AGM season coming up, um, they have actually changed guidelines relating to how people are running their AGMs. So there's a few, I think there's six things that have yep. actually been um, adjusted. And I think it's important that we just go through this and just let break it down for people because trying to find all this information, and it's probably going to change anyway, with a lot of these regulators can be quite difficult. Um, but we've also just ran um, a report in relation to um, online investor relations and AGMs with the Governance Institute of Australia. And they... There's some work going on, yeah, if you can hear that, apologies. We do have construction happening. 22% of people <laughs> actually prefer um, online events as opposed to the physical ones. But now with the new guidelines, you actually don't have to have a physical event, no. physical people there, in order for your AGMs to actually take place. So here's some tips for taking your AGM um, virtual. Sorry, I skipped that. Um, here are the new rules. So the deadline has been extended by two months. We yep. won't go into that um, anymore. However, hybrid and virtual AGMs are now allowed, so you don't necessarily always need that physical attendance. And the other main one to note is if you are taking your events online, your annual general meetings or your investor relations events, virtual technology is key, and that technology needs to be able to facilitate participation, either yes. through Q&A or polling. Yeah, so members being able to ask questions of the auditor and about the management is the key one. Yep. And voting being delivered via poll technology yep. is the other one. Yeah. So that's the really big thing. And the other thing is yeah, just giving them a minimum of two days notice yeah. before you hold it yeah. is by that. Yeah. Um, so we won't go into this too much. There is actually, if you go online, there's a whole breakdown in a blog. Yep. But it's just to let everyone know that here's what this does mean when it comes to AGMs and we know the season is coming up. And really when it does come to AGMs, a lot of this information is the same as the majority of the events anyway. So presenter briefings, reports, video, everything we've discussed today. Yeah, video doesn't, like, video isn't key for when doing this. It's a lot of very... Uh, detailed information that's going out in these sort of things. And even for your presenters having to present this, they might not be comfortable having a webcam right in their face. So look at more of an audio with slides presentation for these ones. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, that brings us to the end. Um, we have no more questions, but as always, feel free to ask us afterwards. We will be sending you the recording uh, within 48 hours. So look out for that on Monday morning. But thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you guys so much. Bye.